Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special episode of the Russian Empire History Podcast. Sorry for the delay in getting this episode out. It coincided with some non-podcast related factors, and both this episode and the members episode on the Muslim conquest of Central Asia that came out last week were longer than usual. Thank you to everyone who sent in a question. I got some really good questions. No one asked about subjects we have already covered in the podcast, which I am interpreting as meaning I've been doing a decent job of explaining the stuff we've covered. Some of the questions are about things that we are going to be covering in detail in upcoming episodes. This means I haven't been able to get into too much detail here, so my apologies for that. But you will be getting a full answer later. Probably a much better one, given the constraints of a single episode for this Q&A. Anyway, let's get into it. Annie asks, What are your favourite and least favourite periods in the history of the Russian Empire? I'm going to start with this easy question, because I think it will cast some light on a couple of other questions. My main interests, since I was at university a long time ago, have been the rise in the national consciousness of the non-Slavic peoples of the Russian Empire in the 19th century, particularly the Tatars, and the ethnographic work that was done in the early Soviet period, especially in Central Asia. I'm looking forward to getting to those periods in the podcast in a few years. I'm also looking forward to covering some of the big rulers, the ones who are well known outside Russia, you know, like Ivan the Terrible, Peter I and Catherine II. I think it will be very interesting to delve into how much they actually match or don't match their popular reputations. Maybe Ivan was just another early modern European ruler, rather than a crazed despot. Peter was really a tyrannical mass murder, rather than a liberating reformer. And Catherine was the quintessential modern European imperialist, rather than a romantic friend of the Enlightenment. Of course, this podcast declares its mission as telling the story of all the peoples of the Russian Empire, and there are some that are definitely less known than they should be. Steppe peoples are still highly underrated and subject to dated and prejudiced stereotypes and assumptions. Central Asia, from antiquity to the early modern period, is absolutely fascinating, incredibly important in world history, yet little known today. You have the Greek kingdoms, the Silk Road trade network, built by the people of Central Asia, not the Chinese or Romans, who also spread Christianity, Buddhism and Islam, along with literacy, across half the continent. If you have ever wondered how Islam went from being the faith of an extractive colonialist elite to a universal religion, the answer lies in Central Asia. The preservation of classical learning in places like Samarkand and Bukhara, which rivaled Baghdad as a Muslim intellectual centre, the Timurid Renaissance and more. Central Asia has had a direct impact on shaping the world we all live in today and really deserves to be better known. As for least favourites, well, we're right in the middle of one now. In the introduction to the crisis of medieval Russia, 1200 to 1304, John Fennell writes, quote, The available Russian sources provide remarkably little information on the social and economic conditions of the age. In them we find practically no details of agrarian traditions, of trade, of land ownership, of legal administration of the tax and tribute system in Russia. From the Chronicles, our main source of information for the period, we do learn a considerable amount about the relationships of the numerous rulers of the separate principalities with one another 
their conflicts, their alliances, their family connections, their military ventures. End quote. And I think we can all see that over the last few episodes. We simply have very few records from this time, and the Chronicles are no longer fanciful propaganda works like they were a century or two ago that are fun to analyse. They tend to decline into, in the year X, Y attacked Z. Then they became friends and attacked W. Then W became friends with Z and attacked Y, and so on. It's very dry. We're often not told why people did things. Large gaps are just skipped over, and we're told very little about the personality of the people involved. At the same time, this is an essential period to cover, as we have the seeds of the successes of Rus forming there in the background, if we can just figure out what's actually happening. But if you've been finding recent episodes a bit repetitive, don't worry, the Mongols will soon be along to liven things up. War is also not one of my main interests, so I'll be very glad to reach periods where we are able to discuss life, art, religion, science, commerce, and other subjects in more detail. Greg asks a couple of questions. What, would you say, led places like Novgorod and Pskov to become republics as opposed to apanages with more or less absolutist monarchs, in which they themselves would consolidate like Muscovy? I include this given that you are, by the end of last episode, at the point where the Republic of Novgorod will emerge. And to what extent can you trust the academic literature on Russian history from Russia itself, especially that produced in the last 10 years? Both of these questions I pose as I am writing a trilogy of historical novels set from the fall of Pskov to the time of Troubles. Much of the literature around non-Muscovite perspectives is scant, and much of that written about Pskov is quite pro-Muscovy. I understand I might be jumping the gun. Great questions, Greg, and it sounds like a very interesting project you have going on there. To tackle the second one first, which I'm interpreting as a question about academic freedom, and maybe whether we should see the recent work of Russian historians as propaganda, or maybe subject to censorship as well. I think we need to start by saying that there can be a divide between the history that's in schools or on TV or in bestsellers, and what's going on in the ivory towers. This is certainly not unique to Russia, it's one of the favourite questions of culture warriors around the world, and even in countries where they may more or less align, you will often find popular history lagging far behind where academic history is going. It's true that academic freedom in Russia has been declining, like every other kind of freedom since Putin returned to the presidency a decline that's accelerated since 2018 and has been directly attacked since the invasion of Ukraine in 2022. There are various aspects of this. First, the general trend in Putinism to assert central control over everything. In the 2000s, university rectors were returned to being state appointees. They, in turn, controlled the appointments and funding of the administrative and teaching staff of their universities. And since most universities are state universities, whether they are under federal or regional control, they receive most of their funding from the state. At the same time as this process was underway, the state had other priorities that supported academic freedom. Early Putinism had declared objectives of making Russia competitive internationally, 
quality research and academic work was seen as desirable and valuable, new universities following what were perceived as international models were established as centres of excellence with generous funding and a high degree of freedom. They and other leading universities were seen as a source of international prestige. Foreign academics taught and conducted research in Russia. Russian academics worked widely with international colleagues and on international projects. Uh, this has all been ground down over the last 10 years. Putin turned to hostility to the West and isolationism rather than attempting to build Russia's place in the world, and the increasing authoritarianism has impacted academics severely. International connections, which many historians had, have become a liability. The law on foreign agents has been extended to any individuals who are funded or otherwise under foreign influence, which can be defined in any way that is necessary. The law has been used against academics critical of the regime or the war. Anyone designated a foreign agent is barred from teaching positions and unable to work with universities or other educational institutions. The laws on state secrets and espionage can be used against anyone who researches, say, environmental history that considers nuclear issues, even if they are using published materials or get their work signed off by the relevant authorities. In a notorious 2022 case, Dmitry Kolka, a physicist, was arrested by the FSB on charges of treason while in hospital receiving treatment for cancer. He was moved to a Moscow pre-trial detention center and died a month later. The charges rested on a lecture he had given to Chinese students several years earlier. He had submitted the lecture to the FSB for clearance and it had been approved. Archive access has become more and more restricted, so historians face the risk that the information they accessed entirely lawfully has now been designated as a state secret. It's no secret that Putin has made the Second World War and the Soviet victory a key part of the Russian identity that the regime promotes. Laws have been passed banning historians from comparing Stalinist Russia and Nazi Germany or considering any Soviet crimes in the war. Amendments have made the law so ambiguous that it can be interpreted any way the authorities need, and essentially any discussion of the war that does not match the official line becomes risky. The Ministry of Higher Education and Science has issued an order requiring academics to notify the Ministry of meetings with foreign colleagues and report on what was discussed. Like many rules, no one enforces it, but it is there on the books any time the authorities decide they need it. Didn't report a meeting with a foreign colleague? Perhaps you're a spy. At the beginning of the invasion, the state-appointed rectors of Russia's leading universities signed a letter supporting Putin and the so-called special military operation. It doesn't really matter whether they actually did or not. They have tied themselves to the regime and put down a marker for all the academics working under them. Any academic who speaks out against the war risks losing their position and potential imprisonment as do their students. Thousands have spoken out and have been fired or moved abroad and some are in prison. The flagship new universities have been completely stripped of their independence and international connections and turned into tools of the regime. Arseny Petrov, a professor of art history in Moscow who fled to Italy in 2022, said in an interview last year that, quote, it is impossible to speak of freedom of research within the field of humanities, not only in the present, but also in a deeper historical perspective. 
After all, the very ideology of modern power includes the production of many historical postulates, and Putin himself published articles on history. It's characteristic that the former Minister of Culture and now leading ideologue, Vladimir Medinsky, is the head of a very influential structure, the Military Historical Society. The ideology of Putin's Russia rests primarily on the suggestion of historical and moral superiority over other countries. The main proof advanced is the victory in the Second World War. The Military Historical Society popularizes this idea and supervises the creation of military historical monuments. Thus, the war between Russia and Ukraine for Putin is a kind of creation of history. All other ideas depend on this, and now it is obvious that all evaluation of the war of its presuppositions as well as the cultural, economic and political consequences must correspond to the official version. In this respect, I repeat, therefore, all disciplines within social sciences and humanities, sociology, history, political science, economics, philology, and so on, are under attack. End quote. For the period of history that we have been covering and which Greg is interested in, what we might call an official line has also appeared, although maybe it has not so far been enforced to the same degree as the history of World War II, or the Great Patriotic War as it's known in Russia. We have already touched on this in some episodes, especially regarding Vladimir the Great and what's been happening with him in Russia. You'll recall there that the original initiative came from the church, which had a strong desire to right what they saw as the wrongs in Soviet history's treatment of the church and Christianity in Russian history. And I think that's been true for the subject of Rus generally. Putin and the state have picked up on it somewhat later, as it became useful to his plans. Putin particularly likes the story of Rurik. The Tsars did too. In the late imperial historiography, the supposed invitation of the people to Rurik, asking him to come and rule over them, was presented as making a choice for autocracy and a benevolent monarch, which then supposedly became the natural order of things for the unique and distinct civilization of Russia. You can see what Putin's interest here is. The official line has been promoted through a museum exhibit project called Russia My History. The project kicked off in 2013 with an exhibition titled The Romanovs. According to the project website, it is intended as an expression of thanks to this unique Russian family, which has been lied about and defamed like no other. That exhibition was followed by a prequel the Rurikovici in 2014. The exhibitions were created by the Patriarchal Council for Culture of the Russian Orthodox Church, with funding from Kremlin-controlled fossil fuel giant Gazprom. Historian Yekaterina Klimenko has described the Russia My History Project as embodying a quest for historical continuity. It depicts Russian history as starting from Rurik and following a cycle in which an authoritarian ruler successfully builds the empire while weak leaders allow decentralization and the loss of territory. Putin is presented as the spiritual heir to the great leaders of the past, restoring Russia's past glory. These exhibitions, as well as the latest one which covers Peter I, are quite innovative. They don't involve any actual artifacts, just digital reconstructions, animated displays and infographics. You proceed through them following a single route along the timeline. Historical figures that played a positive role are helpfully lit up in green, while the villains are lit in red. They can be staged anywhere, anytime, and have appeared all across Russia. Millions of children have been taken to them on school trips 
The exhibitions were masterminded by Father Tikhon Shevgunov, since promoted to Bishop of Pskov, who produced a documentary back in 2008 titled The Fall of an Empire, The Lesson of Byzantium, an equally tangentious reading of history that blamed the fall of Byzantium on Western influence, excessive liberalization, and disloyal oligarchs, as well as promoting the Moscow is the Third Rome line. In picking out the role of the church in this, what I want to say is that there is a considerable degree to which this is organic. It is people who have always held these positions, who have been given more of a soapbox as their beliefs become useful to the regime, rather than a question of academic historians being pushed into changing their positions to toe the party line or create propaganda. So, does this mean we cannot trust the Russian academic literature from the last 10 years? No, not at all. First, books and articles can be years or even decades in the making, and much that was published in the last 10 years was based on research from freer times. While we have to say that Putin's interest in and use of history is well known, it has until recently been fairly limited in scope. Most historians' work was of no interest to the state. Historians in Russia have studied and published work examining and criticizing the official line, challenging traditional historiography, imperial or Soviet, and producing much that is well worth reading. Works by Western authors, highly critical of various aspects of contemporary and historical Russia, have also been translated and published in Russian. A hybrid or authoritarian state is not the same as a dictatorship. To illustrate, Medinsky, the former Minister of Culture and head of the Military Historical Society referred to a few minutes ago, published a series of books a few years ago under the title Myths About Russia. As you might guess, they tackled various negative stereotypes about Russia and received significant support, including the biggest print run for a history book in Russia and an accompanying TV show. It was promoted by regional governments within their public service advertising budgets. So, official history as propaganda. But these books were widely criticised in the press, especially for attempting to put a positive spin on every aspect of Russian history. A group of historians published books in response, titled Anti-Medinsky, How the Party of Power Corrects, in quotes, History, and The Pseudo-History of the Second World War, New Myths from the Kremlin, with one of the authors dismissing Medinsky's work as illogical agitprop gibberish. So, by all means, read the Russian literature if you are able to. I will be using Russian sources extensively in the parts of the podcast dealing with non-Slavic peoples, for example. If I was going to rely on non-Russian literature, I would not have much to work with. But read it the same way you read historians from anywhere, with consideration for their assumptions and biases, traditions, the historiography, and other contexts. I think it's always worth remembering that something does not have to be right to be worth reading. A book that challenges what you think you know about something can help you clarify why you take a different position or reconsider your own assumptions, and sometimes things can look different from different angles. This also goes for reading history from other parts of the former Soviet Union as well. Most of them have their own blind spots or historical controversies that have yet to be fully examined, just like even countries with a less contested past do. In any case, I doubt you will find much that is either pure propaganda or simply an attempt to present a traditional narrative, outside of school textbooks, unfortunately. <laughs>
If you do, it will probably be obvious hack work that's not worthy of your attention. There are also many Russian historians working outside Russia today and producing outstanding work. However, I do think that we may have reached a turning point now that means we may not see much good work published in Russia in the future, as Arseny Petrov said in the quote a few minutes ago. Returning to the first question regarding the Republic of Novgorod, yes, as you've rightly guessed, you are jumping the gun a bit, and we will shortly be moving on to this subject in the podcast. I think you will find the discussions interesting, and we will be looking at what exactly it would mean for Novgorod to be a republic. By definition, it is essential for the government of a republic to be representative. But was the government of Novgorod representative, and if so, of whom? To link this back to what we have just been discussing, Soviet historians have often simply accepted that it was a republic, because it fitted their ideological concept of history as governed by universal laws of development. There had to be classes, and those classes had to be represented as part of the natural historical development of Russia. This approach was extended to the treatment of various other Vichy and Sabor across the centuries without much examination of this assumption. Some Western historians building on the Russian historiography have likewise accepted this assumption, but others have challenged it also and some have rejected it entirely. We will definitely be getting into this question, so I won't say too much on it for now. I think you're right to see it as a kind of opposition, for sure. By the time of Ivan the Terrible, he thought that rulers by birthright and rulers who were selected in some way were very different things, and that birthright rulers were significantly superior. Even in the case of peers like the King of Sweden or Elizabeth I of England, who he was reluctant to accept as brother royals. You've also picked up on another problem that the later chronicles are heavily biased and have numerous parts rewritten later to present the official story. There are parts in which the contemporary record has been completely erased. This is not just the case for the Muscovite Chronicle. The Galician Volinian Chronicle is also notably biased. As I noted in the first answer, we are indeed working with limited materials in this era, and it can be hard to reconstruct the actual events, even where we might be sure that the Chronicle is not telling us the truth. James asks, were all the Russian princes really kings, even if we're talking about younger sons ruling one small town or people who are dropping out of the succession line and left with just three or four towns? This is a good question, and I'm glad you asked because I have to admit that my position on this has shifted a bit, so I wanted to come back to it. I still think the general argument for the Princes of Rus being kings that we've discussed in the podcast and in the interview with Christian Raffensperger, who is of course a major proponent of this terminology, is watertight. The etymology of Knyaz is the same as King and Konung. The contemporary chronicles from Rus neighbours and travellers' reports are also clear that the rulers of Rus are Rex while, for example, their Polish and Lithuanian counterparts are ducks. So that's not an issue. I'm also quite willing to accept Raffensperger's argument that any confusion comes from us conflating king and monarch, monarch meaning sole ruler, which is an anachronism. Fair enough. Prince is also clearly wrong and an anachronism 
in that it definitionally means a ruler who is nominally or actually subject to a king or emperor, and the rulers of Rus were not. However, I have reconsidered my position on the question of what the value is in using king. In the interview with Raffensperger, he said that we should use king because they used king. But now I think this would be true if they meant the same thing by king as we do. If they did not, maybe we would be better off using knyaz, just like we use shah, khan, maharaja or sultan, or indeed tsar, which the Russians adopted to assert that they were emperors, but we don't translate it into English like that. I think this would avoid both the issues with Prince being an objectively wrong rendering of Knyaz in Rus, but correct in the sense it's used in later Imperial Russian history, and confusion over what King meant in Rus. Because never mind three towns in the Kiev lands, by the time we get to the end of Rus, there will be people with one village in the forest calling themselves Knyaz. So, having reached a turning point in the history of Rus, when we return to the narrative, I am going to start using Knyaz instead of King. Jürgen asks, can you tell us something about marriage alliances, trade missions, or diplomatic missions of the Kiev and Rus with other rulers in Europe or Asia? So, three often related things about which we have limited information for the same reason. The monks writing the chronicles didn't care about them. Generally, where we do know about these things, we know about them from non-Rus records. This is not necessarily the result of the Rus not having other records themselves, or maybe not writing. It's more a question of what has survived. As I think I've noted before, the handful of written records that we have from Rus are almost all ecclesiastical works. But, for example, the trade agreements with Byzantium provided for the exchange of written messages between Kiev and Constantinople, not to mention the tale stating that Yaroslav spent his time writing and reading. It's likely that there were Rus records that simply have not survived. I can't provide much information on trade missions from this period. Formal missions sent by one Knyaz or another to open new routes would have been rare. The Rus fitted into existing trade networks, connecting the Baltic to the Volga and Central Asia, the Jewish trade networks, the routes to Germany and Hungary. The big example we have is Constantinople, where the Rus turned up in force to persuade the Byzantines to give them a trade agreement, and that agreement is incorporated into the tale. More surprisingly, perhaps, we have something of a similar situation with the church. There is an assumption that the southern Slavs, who had converted earlier, must have had an influence and involvement in the Christianization of Russia. Arguments are made about priests coming from Serbia or Bulgaria to teach Russian Slavs about their new faith. Attempts are made to attribute various parts of liturgies to a southern Slav influence. But we essentially have next to no information on this, and it's one of those things that is believed because it makes sense that it would be true. These gaps in our knowledge mean that even when we know who married who, we often still have to guess what the reason for the marriage was, assuming that most royal marriages were connected with trade or diplomacy. So we can start with Vladimir the Great, who was married to Anna Porphyrogenita, sister of the emperor. All the signs are that this was a diplomatic marriage associated with the Rus providing troops to Byzantium in exchange for the royal marriage. 
which itself required the acceptance of Christianity. However, Vladimir, who you may remember the German chronicler Tietmar of Meersburg called a fornicator amensus, continued to have other women and numerous children by several mothers, while none from Anna. Maybe Anna was infertile, or it just worked out that way, or maybe they had a different arrangement in their marriage agreement. For Vladimir's son, Yaroslav, the Rus sources tell us little about his marriage to Ingegerd of Sweden, but the Scandinavian sources tell us more. They tell us that she was first betrothed to Olaf, the future king of Norway, but the betrothal was broken off when Yaroslav sent his envoys to negotiate with her father, King Olaf Skotkonung. The Scandinavian sources also tell us that she was party to the discussions and that her consent was required. The negotiations dealt with land and resources. It's been a while, so in case anyone's forgotten, Yaroslav was looking for men to help him take control of Rus. Ingegerd demanded control of Ladoga in exchange, with her man, Jarl Ragnar Holfsen, to rule there. This would presumably have involved a household of some size being moved into Rus. Clearly, this was a marriage determined by diplomatic considerations, including trade as Ladoga near Novgorod was connected to the Baltic routes. It was probably also this marriage and the resulting connection to Scandinavia that made Yaroslav's court so attractive to the various asylum seekers that ended up there. We get most of the information on them from Scandinavian sources as well, especially the Heimskringler. Starting from Ingegerd's previous betrothed, who ended up marrying her sister. Starting from Ingegerd's previous betrothed, who ended up marrying her sister, Olaf of Norway and his son Magnus. Later on, Yaroslav and Ingegerd married their children to some of these visitors. Elizabeth was married to Harald Hardrada, which not only sealed his alliance with Yaroslav, the sagas suggest that they were close, but also gave him the support of Ingegerd's kinsman, Knut Estridsson, king of Denmark, when Harald was realising his claim to rule Norway. Ingegerd was likely involved in diplomatic relations with Scandinavia and the negotiations for her children's marriages, which led to her contemporaries calling her Ingegerd the Wise, something that only happened to her husband centuries later. We know about the marriages of seven of their ten children, which is pretty good going for the time given that we don't even know the names of all the children of some of the Knyazes. We can see that these were diplomatic marriages. Some, like Elizabeth's, were to spouses who had spent time in Kiev, who were friends and allies of Yaroslav, and are often described as Yaroslav betting on their success. It paid off with Harold Hardrada. It did not pay off with Edward the Exile, who died before he could win the throne of England. But it was not all about Yaroslav trying to reach out or break into the European royal marriage market and establish diplomatic relations. Henri Capet, King of France, took the initiative in getting himself a Rus bride. Two French bishops, Gautier of Mont and Goslin of Sorny were sent to Kiev to conduct the negotiations. On the Rus side, we have no records, so we have no idea what was discussed beside the marriage. But they successfully returned to France the following year with Anna. As Christian Raffensperger discussed, she had a high status in France choosing the name of her son and heir to the throne, and introducing the name Philip to the royal family. 
She ruled France as regent after the death of Henri. She was referred to in the royal documents as joint king and signed her name as Anna Regina, using Cyrillic letters for the Latin phrase. We have to assume that Yaroslav saw diplomatic and trade opportunities associated with the marriage, but once again we simply don't have the sources. Yaroslav's second son, Izyaslav, married Gertrude, the sister of Casimir the Restorer. Although it might seem natural for the royal families of neighbouring countries to intermarry, in this case it was Casimir who was looking for the diplomatic benefits. His aim was to restore a united Poland, and that meant he needed allies. In the West, his mother connected him to the Holy Roman Empire but he also needed friends in the East. This diplomatic outreach was very successful. Remember how Yaroslav even suppressed Mazovia for him. The alliance was strengthened by Kashmir marrying Yaroslav's sister, Dobroniega. These marriages had long-term effects. We have already heard about Polish involvement in internal Rus affairs several times and claims that are based on these marriages will have a major impact in centuries to come. The marriage of another son of Yaroslav, Sievolod, is perhaps the ideal example of just how much the Rus chroniclers ignored women. Nothing is said about his wife other than that she is a Byzantine princess. We only find out her name because her son, Vladimir Monomach, uses it. Like Anna and Philip, the fact that he uses her name is an indication that she was important in the family and to his identity. The Rus were not yet using surnames. Despite this, the chroniclers do not see fit to provide us with any information about her, not when or why the marriage took place or anything else. In this case, the Byzantine records have also been lost, so no help there either. The emperor at the time was Constantine IX Monomachus, so we can assume that she was related to him, but little more. The usual conjecture is that the marriage was arranged as part of settling relations after Yaroslav's aborted attack on Constantinople. This incident is a good illustration of how the chroniclers sometimes only recorded what was important to them and not what was important to the people that they were writing about. Vladimir Monoma goes on to marry Guta, the daughter of Harold Godwinson, the last Anglo-Saxon king of England. We might wonder what this marriage was intended to achieve, with her father dead and the Normans ruling in England. It would appear that there was nothing to be gained diplomatically from the Union. However, Guther was related to the same network of Scandinavian nobles that the Rus had been marrying into. When the Normans conquered England, she took refuge with them in Scandinavia. So, as well as being of the requisite noble birth, by marrying her, Vladimir Monomach reinforced the familial ties to Scandinavia and probably earned some alliance points. These ties were then further reinforced by his son, Mstislav Vladimirovich, or King Harold of Gartha, son of Valdemar, as he was called in the Heims Kringle. His first marriage was to Kristin who was the daughter of King Inge Steinkelsen of Sweden. Inge was another Scandinavian ruler with close ties to Rus. He was a Christian, and in 1075 he was driven out of Sweden for refusing to perform certain pagan rites. Like other Scandinavian exiles, he went to Kiev. This was during the reign of Sivalod. After a few years, he returned home, killed his usurper, and recovered the throne. 
We do not have any information from either Rus or Scandinavian sources as to whether he had Rus assistance with this, or anything as to why, 20 years later, he chose to marry his daughter to Mstislav. We can assume that there must have been some kind of alliance. Inge had an ongoing conflict with Norway, and the marriage may have sealed a deal for some kind of Rus support. We also don't have any information about what Kristin did in Rus, where she lived for nearly 30 years. We do know that, like the marriages with Polish royalty discussed above, the established relationship was treated as significant by both Sweden and Rus and its successors, and it will come up again in diplomatic relations we will be covering in the future. Incidentally, Inga was succeeded by his nephew Philip, who married Ingegard, the daughter of Harold Hardrada and Elizabeth of Kiev, keeping the familial ties going for another generation. As I have noted several times, our main source of information on these marriages comes from the non Rus party. By the time we get into the 12th century, the pool of eligible nobility within Rus has expanded, and the ruling clan's degrees of separation have become sufficient over generations for internal marriages to become more common, which means we end up not knowing anything about them a lot of the time. This especially goes for the men. The children of Mstislav and Kristin are a good example. We mostly know who their daughters married, as their husbands were not Rus. We mostly don't know who their sons married, as they married inside Rus. For the oldest son, Sevalod, the chronicle merely notes that he was married, and then a few years later that he was imprisoned with his wife and children. His wife is never identified. Izyaslav Mstislavich who we saw taking Kiev several times, had a first wife we know absolutely nothing about, and a second wife who was the daughter of a ruler of Abkhazia, a kingdom on the Black Sea. She is not ever named. We also don't know anything about why they were married. And this is a particularly intriguing case, as marriages to the south were rare. Presumably there were either diplomatic or trade reasons involved. But Izyaslav died the same year, and it's never mentioned again. When we get to the daughters, we have one internal marriage that we do know about, which has been mentioned. I'm talking about Maria, who you'll recall was married to Vsevolod, the son of Alex Svitoslavich of Chernihiv. This marriage was clearly an attempt to regulate the rivalry that had developed between the two branches of the ruling clan. Christian Raffensberger also thinks that Svevolod could have used the marriage to shore up his claim to the throne when he took Kiev. We know about the marriage of two other daughters, Malmfred and Ingeborg, but only from foreign sources. The Rus records tell us nothing. Malmfred married King Sigurd of Norway, who was also known as Sigurd the Crusader. In 1107, he became the first European king to personally lead a crusade, taking around 5,000 Norwegians to the eastern Mediterranean to support the new kingdom of Jerusalem. He travelled to the Mediterranean by the western route, but on his return from Constantinople, he passed through Rus and arranged for the marriage to Malmfred Haraldsdottir, as the saga calls her. She presumably had a Slavic name as well, but we don't know what it was. They were married for nearly 20 years and had one daughter, Kristin Sigurdsdottir. Sigurd was succeeded by an illegitimate son, Magnus, who was just eight and Malmfred stayed at the court to assist him with his rule. A few years later, she arranged for Magnus to marry her niece, daughter of her sister Ingeborg. 
Ingeborg had married the son of a previous king of Denmark. He was killed in a conflict over who would rule the Baltic coast, but by then they'd already had four children, and the sisters combined to protect their positions. So Magnus married his stepmother's niece Kristin, who thus became the Queen of Norway, while Malmfred married Kristin's uncle on the Danish side, a man with the unforgettable name of Eric the Memorable, who went on to become the King of Denmark. Ingeborg's youngest son, Valdemar, named in honour of Vladimir Monomach, became Valdemar the Great, ruler of Denmark for 30 years and founder of a dynasty that ruled until the end of the 13th century. From Mstislav's second marriage, his daughter Yevrosinia married Giza II of Hungary. This was a union based in diplomacy. Hungary was a rival to the Germans looking for allies, while the Mstislavici used the Hungarians for support in internal conflicts. You'll have heard reference to various Knesses turning up with Hungarian allies to support their claims, and that all stems from this marriage. Yefrosinia's brother Vladimir married an unnamed daughter of the Ban of Croatia. The Ban was a kind of viceroy who ruled Croatia under the crown of Hungary. This is also an intriguing one because it's the only case we know of where a member of a Rus ruling family married a South Slav. However, once again, we know little about it. As you can see, by the time of Mstislav, the rulers of Rus had built substantial ties with the ruling families of Scandinavia, Poland and Hungary. In the future, these ties will give rise to claims, and we will be seeing the effects of these marriages for several centuries to come. From around the time of Vladimir Monomach, as I think I've mentioned in passing, the Rus also began marrying into the families of steppe rulers. In this case, only the men were involved. They did not give their daughters to unbelievers. Of the rulers we've encountered so far, probably Yuri Dolgoruki is the most important case. His first wife was the daughter of one of the Palovsi Khans, Ayapa. This is probably why we have frequently mentioned Yuri and his sons, Palovtian allies, who seem to be more reliable than the Palovtian allies of other Knyazes. Most of Yuri's 15 known children come from this marriage, including Rostislav, who became the Knyaz of Periaslavl, Ivan, who ruled Kursk, Olga, who married Yaroslav Osmomisil, Andrei Bogolubsky, Gleb, who we've frequently mentioned, Mstislav, who became Knyaz of Novgorod, and others. Dolgoruki had a second wife, who some historians argue was a member of the Komnenos dynasty, then ruling Byzantium. She returned to Constantinople after his death. I hope that fills out the picture a little bit, Jürgen, and there will be plenty of diplomatic action to look forward to in the post-Mongol period. On a somewhat related note, Hannah asks, I really enjoyed the episode on Olga of Kiev. When will we hear some more about the women of Rus? I wish I had better news for you, Hannah, but our dearth of information will be carrying on for a while yet. So I'm afraid I will have to ask you and anyone else keen to hear more about Rus women to be patient. I will be including as much as I can about women in the upcoming episode about life in Rus but I understand this is based mostly on the material evidence and it's not quite the same with us hearing about actual people with personalities. Mm -hmm.
Jeff asks, in many episodes you relate how the citizens of various cities exert a lot of influence on who they will and won't accept as a ruler. I blithely thought that they wouldn't really have any say in such things at all, and that rulership was just decided by the ruling elites and imposed on the citizens. How were they organized to decide and convey their wishes, and what was the social structure that permitted this to happen? You're asking the difficult questions here, Jeff. I'm sorry that I'm not going to answer your question properly here, because, as I already mentioned in the question about the Republic of Novgorod, it's a subject we're going to be looking at in greater detail as we move forward. I can say that there's quite a debate on this subject in the historiography. Of course, we need to note that the citizens of Kiev or whatever, expressing their opinion on who should be the next Knyaz, does not necessarily mean that the ruling elites were not deciding and imposing their choice. It just means that they were not only using brute force to do so. The evidence suggests that there were factions led by wealthy merchants, some historians see as oligarchs, military leaders and churchmen, along with the followers of the ruling families, the Monomashechi, Mstislavichi, Olgovichi of Chernihiv, who all seem to have had their agents in rival towns. As elsewhere throughout history, these factions would have manipulated the masses through charity, bribery, spreading rumours and disinformation, and all the other eternal political tools. It's also probably quite normal for the citizens to develop some loyalty to the families of leaders that they thought did a good job. Not a satisfactory answer now, I know, but stick with me on this one and we will get into it. Danny Boy asks, was the Rus army like the Viking or Anglo-Saxon armies, or more like a steppe army? Good question. We haven't talked much about changes in the Rus army lately, but you are heading along the right track. In terms of their original fighting style, the Rus were indeed part of a northern European continuum running from the Volga to Iceland. We might think of all the Scandinavians who spent time in Rus, the stories in the sagas, or the Varangian Guard. Although it began as Rus warriors, many Scandinavians, Anglo-Saxons, and other Northern Europeans served in the Guard together, indicating that they did have at least some degree of a common fighting style. The first Rus would naturally have fought like Vikings because that is what they were. They fought on foot and travelled mainly by river. As they came to rule the Slavs and other peoples in the region, they were supplemented by tribal levies and then town militias, which were also primarily infantry. They fought in a shield war formation surrounding the leader, with each army trying to break the other's wall. As they added cavalry, they adopted steppe and Byzantine tactics instead, but the basic idea still remained. In later Rus armies, we see them forming a core defensive position with wagons, and still later they will develop the mobile fort, a kind of prefabricated building that was taken by wagon and rapidly erected on the battlefield as a command position. By the 12th century, where we are now in the story, most armies consisted of a shield wall of spearmen with archers behind and cavalry on the wings. Because they so often fought against highly mobile steppe enemies, Rus armies were noted for paying particular attention to taking a defensive position using natural features, such as rivers, or forests or rocks, to guard their rear and flanks. This was the case even when they were fighting against European armies, 
Horses were initially adopted as a means of transport rather than a weapon. This was similar to the situation in Britain where Saxon and Viking armies would ride to a battle but dismount and fight on foot. The Rus gradually adopted mounted fighting techniques from their steppe neighbours and rivals, but cavalry forces were primarily supplied by allied peoples. Think of the Torks, Polovci and Chornikluboki. The Druzhinas and Variagi formed a well-equipped corps force at the disposal of a Knyaz, varying in size depending on how much the ruler could afford to support them. The Druzhinas were a mixed bunch. They did not have to be of notable birth or a local ethnicity. Lowly origins were not an impediment for a competent warrior, and many steppe warriors whether outcast for some reason or simply adventurers, also joined. The Ruzhinas adapted to horses faster than the larger armies. Due to the mixed origin of their membership, which provided hands-on knowledge, their greater experience fighting in the steppe, frequent hunting, which served as training just as it did in steppe cultures, and greater all-round professionalism. However, the Druzhinas were primarily for enforcing the rule of the Knyaz and collecting tribute and taxes. They were an elite, but an elite that was too small in numbers for fighting actual wars. The tribal levies were first used as a kind of home defence, while the Rus were on their expeditions to Constantinople, Bulgaria, or against the steppe. As the towns of Rus grew in the 11th century, urban militias became more important. We mentioned a Tisyatka from Novgorod a couple of episodes back, a commander of a Tisitsha, or Thousand, the basic unit of the militia. This organization was adopted from the steppe. You probably recall that this was the Turkic decimal system of organizing their forces. Like in Turkic armies, the Tisyatka commanded Sotniks, who headed a Sotnya, or hundred. The local ruler was responsible for equipping the militia. Wealthier cities were more generous, but the militias were generally not especially well equipped. In the 11th century, they were primarily armed with spears and axes, but by the 13th century, archers and crossbowmen were common. By this point, the peasants of the earlier levies were relegated to providing food and transportation. The militias were most likely raised by the Vecha town councils, formed from the wealthy merchant class. They saw their task as defending their home, and you've probably picked up in the course of the podcast that they could be very reluctant to join in conflicts between Rus leaders rather than against foreign invaders. The problem of the lack of cavalry would have been immediately apparent to the first Rus adventurers to get into a fight with steppe raiders, and being pragmatic people, they naturally looked for allies to fill in the gap. The first such allies were the Torks, who we saw accompanying Sviatoslav on his campaigns. Then came the Pechenegs and the Polovci. The Chronicles treat the Polovci as being less reliable than other steppe allies. The Suzdal Knyazes tried to better secure their alliance through marriage. The rulers of Western Rus also looked west for allies. We've mentioned Polish and Hungarian allies, and they very often supplied cavalry for wars in Rus. The Czorny Klubuki are different to the other steppe allies. You're familiar with the idea of successive waves of migration out of the steppe pushing their predecessors further west. But as more powerful entities like Hungary emerged in the West, this was no longer an option. 
Instead, the defeated peoples were either assimilated or their remnants moved to the edge of the steppe. As the Polovtsi established control over the western steppe, Pechenegs, Torks, Berinde and others looked for a new home in the forest steppe along the southern Rus borderlands, the Ross and the Bukovina rivers, where they were welcomed as a kind of buffer against the Polovtsi. By the 11th century, these groups developed a new identity as the Chorni Klobuki, or Karakol Puk, which you might remember means the black hats or black hoods, the clothing they adopted as a marker. They were regarded as living in their home territory with the permission of the Rus, but were largely autonomous. Their leader was recognized as a Knyaz, and they preserved steppe social structures. The archaeological evidence suggests that they were wealthy and well-equipped, and they formed professional military forces that defended the border and took part in internal conflicts according to their alliances with various knyazes. They were high-quality cavalry, acquitting themselves well against both European forces from Hungary or Poland and the steppe peoples especially the wild Polovtsi who raided from deep in the steppe. Towards the end of the Rus era, they were converting to Christianity, although they chose Catholicism along with the people of what is now Moldova. But any pathway to them transitioning to a sedentary Christian nation was ended by the Mongol invasion. In terms of equipment, by the 12th century, the Rus had moved from the typically Scandinavian dress described by Ibn Fadlan and other travellers to something more distinctive. While the court wore clothing, influenced by Byzantium, and the wealthy enjoyed showing off silk brocade, pretty much everyone else wore the same thing. There was a linen shirt and trousers, which served as underwear in the winter, a kaftan over the top when it was cooler, a coat over the top of that, and then a fur mantle or cloak for winter. The furs were long, down to the ground, and had long sleeves that fully covered the hands, very useful in the winter. Everyone wore fur hats. Russia had plenty of iron, but the traditional historiography has emphasized Western technology and downplayed local and even more steppe craftsmanship. Although we know that the Turkic peoples were skilled iron workers. The Chorni Klobuki, for example, had a reputation for having better quality weapons and armor than the Rus. The development pathway was somewhat different to that in the West. The early Slavs had used shields, spears, javelins, and axes similar to wood chopping axes, as well as light bows. By the 900s, they adopted the Scandinavian style arms of the Rus chainmail hauberks, swords, single edged battle axes, and iron bossed wooden shields. They added certain features to adapt to local conditions and increase the use of horses and then remained much the same for the next 200 years. An iron helmet, often silver-plated, male hauberk, a leather quiver that could also hold their bow, sword or sabre in a decorated sheath, or mace also decorated with silver, and an iron-tipped spear. Horse harnesses were step-style. This hybrid style reflected both their origins and their enemies. In the West and North, the Rus fought static battles against European armies and mobile battles against steppe peoples in the South and East, and they used a variety of weapons as the foe demanded. For example, bows were used everywhere, but slower loading crossbows were only used in the West. You might have been a bit surprised at how often the chronicles mention campaigns taking place in the winter, given the legendary cold of the region and the disasters that struck Napoleon and the Nazis on their winter campaigns there. But the winter frosts actually made wetlands passable, 
Frozen rivers were also used as highways. Spiked boots and horseshoes for walking on ice were already in wide use by the time Rus was emerging. This meant that winter was actually a better time for campaigning than spring, when meltwaters caused flooding, or autumn when rains turned the land to deep mud. But there was a bit of a division here. Winter was the best time for campaigning against other Rus, or in the north. When it came to the steppe, summer was the best time for campaigning, as the dry season meant that grazing, and therefore the readiness and capability of the nomads' horses, declined. The mud and wetlands also made boats preferable to wagons for moving the army's baggage around. Boats had a shallow draft and could be floated along even the shallowest of rivers, often pulled by crews walking the shoreline. Fortified bases were established at the confluence of rivers to keep supplies ready to ship in multiple directions. Portages were always risky, not just in the steppe, also in the northeast, where Finno-Ugrians would raid. Efforts were made to improve passage with timber roads laid to speed the transition from river to river. Sometimes canals were dug where conditions were conducive. We don't actually have a huge amount of knowledge about Russian boats. There's sometimes an assumption that they must have been something like Viking boats. After all, besides their Scandinavian origins, they had frequent Viking visitors. But the sea had little significance for the Rus, and Viking longboats would not have worked on many of the rivers that we know they used. There were plenty of local traditions that they could adapt to as well. Timber frames with inflated skins, the dugouts we know they did use for trade with Byzantium, coracle-type boats, bark canoes and more. Rafts might well have been the most common form of river transportation. We do know that the Rus attempted to control the rivers and made them their primary mode of transport when campaigning. You probably have noted the frequent references to rivers when discussing campaigns in the podcast. This included campaigns outside Rus itself. When Polotsk tried to subjugate neighbouring Bolts, they went by river, as did the Suzdalian army when it attacked the Volga Bulgars. As they developed from an infantry force into a mixed foot and horse army, the cavalry split into two types. There were the horse archers that you would expect from the steppe influence, often they were literally from the steppe, and then riders that fought in close combat with lances, and these were typically from the Druzhinas. Foreign travellers often commented that the Rus had an unusually large number of archers. This was because their infantry also used Viking-style longbows. With a mounted Druzhina or infantry, the Rus archers fought in the European style. They took a position and they shot from that position, rather than step-style volleys from mobile contingents. They had the Chorni Klubuki for that. One thing that you've probably noted in the course of the narrative is that the Rus seem to have frequently avoided actual fighting. We often hear that two rivals begin by making demands or claims. When they don't get what they want, they summon their armies, but then, rather than actually coming to a battle, a settlement is negotiated based on the show of force with the strongest getting his way, or one party just runs away. In addition to the adoption of cavalry, another major development was fortifications. The first Rus to arrive from Scandinavia would have had little experience of fortifications beyond a palisade or of siege warfare. They would have encountered the Khazars' forts, stone-built with Byzantine assistance, and the Slav Gorodishi forts, earthwork and timber buildings in naturally defensible positions, 
that were intended to resist attackers who did not have experience in siege warfare. The Rus continued to use these kinds of defences, with the earliest stone structures being only a couple of dry limestone towers at Staraya Ladoga and Kiev. You'll recall that they moved towards construction of large-scale fortifications under Vladimir. Byzantine craftsmen who came to build the churches taught the Rus how to make unfired bricks. Bricks were used along with timber frames to create better earthworks, and this enabled the Rus to move from reinforcing naturally defensible positions to building new forts with effective all-round defences. These were the forts that were built to control the south, both to defend the southern border against the steppe and to assert Rus control over the territory. Different styles of defence is developed in the south and in the west. We've discussed the southern defences already, with a network of long walls that were designed to impede cavalry movements and the structure of inner and outer lines of defence. In the west, round fortresses were built in the 11th and 12th centuries. Halic in the far southwest was the only part of Rus that built stone castles like further west in Europe, but not in any large number. In the northeast, Susdalia built a network of timber forts to protect merchants on the trade routes. These structures will prove little defence against the Mongols arrive with an extensive experience of siege warfare. For the Rus, on the other hand, the earliest record we have of them attempting to develop siege capabilities is from 1206, when they tried to copy a catapult from German crusaders in the Baltic, but only managed to throw rocks at their own soldiers. So the answer is that yes, the Rus began fighting in much the same style as the Vikings, But by the 12th century, they've developed their own style, incorporating elements of Scandinavian, Byzantine and steppe equipment, and with their own tactics based on the natural conditions in Rus and the different enemies that they encountered. Widmerpool asks, did the different principalities of Rus speak different languages? I'm assuming this is a question about the Slavic languages of Rus, as it should be obvious that the Chud and the Finno-Ugrians, the Black Caps and the other Turkic peoples were speaking other languages. Vladimir Monomach boasted in his testament that he spoke five languages, although we do not know which ones. But I'm afraid this is another one where I'm going to have to defer. This is an important issue, and it's something that I, as a linguist, am particularly interested in, and therefore I've been planning since the very beginning to get an expert in for an interview episode on this subject. That will probably be coming up around the 14th century. In the meantime, to whet your appetite, I can say that the East Slavic languages were starting to diverge around the time that Rus was emerging. They were still largely mutually intelligible. Even today, Slavic languages have quite a high degree of mutual intelligibility, at least in writing. But the signs of separate languages were starting to appear. Think back to our episode on Normanism. If you recall, 19th century Russian historians looking into the tale of bygone years found that there were strong signs of Ukrainian in the language it uses. And these were people who were looking for the opposite result. Novgorod and Pskov also developed their own language, which was distinct from the language emerging in Suzdalia and later Muscovy, the language that would become Russian. Even though Russian was subsequently imposed on Novgorod, the influence of Novgorodian can still be discerned in accents and dialect in the region to this day, despite the legacy of aggressive Soviet standardization. We also have Church Slavonic in the mix, which had a different degree of influence on each of the East Slavic languages. So to summarize, in the period we've covered so far, 
the various principalities of Rus essentially spoke the same language, allowing for regional dialects. East, medieval Russian, and West, Ruthenian, are going to diverge between now and the end of the 15th century, and Belarusian and Ukrainian will also gradually diverge across this period and through to around 1700. But the, also the pictures are a bit more complicated than simply Old East Slavic becoming Russian, Ukrainian and Belarusian. Emils from Riga sent in two questions. One, your last episode on Yuri Dolgoruki's rise to power got me thinking about this king's possible connections to the powerful Dolgoruka family in the Romanov Empire. In the last emperor of direct Romanov descent, Pyotr II Aksejevich, attempted to bequeath the rule of Russia. So the Dolgorukovs were indeed a very prominent Russian family. They married Tsars, were generals, marshals, and governors of various parts of the empire, all the way down to the revolution. In terms of direct blood relation, the Dolgorukovs were descended from the Olgovichi, with Mikhail of Chernihiv, who had the misfortune to be ruling Kiev during the Mongol invasion, taken to be the founder of their house because he established Obolinsk, a town on the Oka around 80 kilometers from Moscow, which was their family domain. They took their original family name, Obolinsky, from the town. So you would have to go all the way back to Yaroslav to find a common ancestor. What they have in common is that they both earn the name Long Arm or Far Reaching, for their behaviour. Yuri, of course, earned it with his attempts to dominate Kiev and southern Rus. Uh, for Ivan Andreevich Obolinsky, who became the first of the House of Dolgorukov to bear the name, he earned it by his reputation for hunting down his enemies no matter where they tried to hide. Unfortunately, we don't know the details, only that he was generally acclaimed as fierce and vengeful. Emils also asks, could you create a special episode analysing the claims made by Putin in his recent interview with Tucker Carlson? Well, that was a bit of an unexpected question. I can't say that I would relish the idea of paying close attention to Putin ranting on for 45 minutes about how he got from Rurik to Lenin. I do think it's important to link the history we're covering through to what is happening today especially where that history is being used to play a bigger and bigger role for the Putin regime. But I think it's better for me to work from where we are in the story, like I tried to do in the episodes on Vladimir the Great or the afterlife of the Khazars, rather than letting Putin take over. Just as a spoiler, as we move into the successes of Rus, we'll be getting into who were the Rus, who called themselves Rus, whether the people in Moscow, Halic, or Smolensk meant the same thing when they called themselves Rus, and covering this in detail. I think that will be the perfect time to tackle the Putin myth of the unified and linear development of a naturally autocratic Russia from Rurik to today. Having said that, I do have a few recent books on memory politics in Putin's Russia on my reading list. So I might end up inviting an expert onto the show to discuss this and history in schools and the use of World War II and the whole subject more widely. To round out the show, I have a couple of history-adjacent questions. Margot asks, have I watched The Great? The Great is purportedly a show about Catherine II, for those who don't know. I have not watched it. I'm aware that it's 
one of those historical shows that plays fast and loose with the source material. And while I think it's perfectly fine to do so, I also do find it a bit annoying when it's actual historical figures rather than a novel. Sorry, Margot, I know it has good reviews, but maybe I'll check it out one day. And finally, Charles Henri asks, what is my favorite Russian novel? Thank you for the question, Charles Henri, and I'm impressed that you think I'm capable of reading novels in addition to everything else I have to read for this podcast. In the spirit of this podcast, I'd like to recommend Zuleikha by Guzel Yakhina. Guzel is a Tatar writer from Kazan, and the novel centers on a young woman named Zuleikha living in a small Tatar village after the revolution. Early on, her husband is killed during dekulakization, and she is exiled to Siberia, arriving with others like her at a designated spot in the wilderness where they barely survived the winter and have to work together to build new lives. Yakina was inspired by the stories her grandmother, who was exiled to Siberia, told her in her childhood, and used other real incidents from people's memoirs in the story. I was encouraged to read it by the older women in my wife's family, who saw their own Tata family stories from that time reflected in the novel. It's been translated into 21 languages, so many of you will be able to find it. And there's also a TV adaptation, which I do not recommend. Just as an aside, there's rather an anti-Russian literature buzz these days, as Ukrainians and others feel that their literature has been squeezed out and unjustly overlooked due to the Russian and Soviet imposition of a monolithic great Russian literature tradition and the Russian erasure of minority culture generally. I'm not fully on board with this, as I think that most of the Russian classics earned their international reputation on their own merits, and some of their opponents are underestimating how much the Western audience reads them critically. But there's also a fair bit of truth to it. So, if you're looking for something Russian to read, why not consider trying something Ukrainian or Estonian or Kyrgyz instead? quick Google is sure to bring you some recommendations. And that's it for this special Q&A episode. Thank you once again to everyone who sent in a question, and thank you all for listening. Until next time, goodbye. (laughs) 